Djibouti is one of those countries invented by man to satisfy his desires for adventure. To keep the mysterious flame alive in a geography that does not appear to be from this world. It's a country carved by fire and water, chiseled by the whims of the gods of hell. Djibouti is located where nobody can ignore it, in the indispensable corner of the Horn of Africa, right where the continent borders Arabia. It's a strategic location, the necessary passage to the Orient from the Suez Canal. In ancient times, it was the meeting point for Indian, Arab, and Greek sailors. Today, it is still a territory receptive to smugglers and go-getters. Life in the desert is hard. When I traveled in the caravan, there was no time to rest. I live for the animals day and night. This is why I came to this city with my family. Here my children can study. I couldn't, but my children will have a different future. Don't think it was easy to leave the desert behind. Our move to the city was difficult, especially trying to find work. The only thing I knew how to do was work with the animals, which is what I do here. Later on, I got a more stable job on the sea, but then I could not stop coming to the beach at night. I do not earn a lot, and with this job, I earn a little more. I have always been attracted to the sea, even when I lived in the interior of the country. Our caravans ended up on the coast, and during the trip, I dreamed for this moment to arrive. Ludbach was born and raised in the desert in the inland region of Djibouti. He is in Afar, one of the two main tribes that populate the country. His family's occupation was transporting salt between Lake Assar and the coast. About 10 years ago, he decided to abandon the nomadic life and migrate to the city of Djibouti. All he wanted was to find a job that would allow him to be in permanent contact with the sea, which is why he enlisted as an assistant on a passenger ship, which makes daily trips between the capital and the town of Abok, located at the other end of the Gulf of Tajura. In just a few years of contact with the sea, Ludbak became a pilot, and today he is the captain of a ship. These vessels are named Dows and are almost as old as the Gulf of Tajura. There are barely any left, the rest having been substituted by faster motorboats or modern ships with a larger cargo capacity. Nonetheless, most legal trade between Yemen and Djibouti, as well as passenger transportation between the different coastal towns, continues to be carried out on the Downs.
Obok was the place where French colonization began in Djibouti. In 1862, the Sultan of Obok sold these lands to the French for 10,000 dollars, and a city began to be built that would soon have 2,000 inhabitants. But the location of Obok was not good for establishing a base, which was going to be an important trading center projecting towards the kingdom of Ethiopia. It was completely surrounded by mountains, which made accessing the interior lands difficult. There was not enough drinkable water, nor a bay where it would be possible to build a port of such importance. Shortly thereafter, the French decided to locate the colonial capital where it currently stands today. From the short period when Obok was the French point of reference on the Horn of Africa, there are only a few decrepit buildings and the home of the poet Arthur Rimbaud still standing. Today, Obok is a sleepy coastal town that continues to live from fishing. Although a lot of time has passed, I remember the years that I spent on the caravan as if it were yesterday. I still travel to the interior sometimes, for celebrations or when someone dies. I don't want my children to lose contact with my family. The salt caravan was the livelihood for everyone. Salt was our means of support. In spite of the gradual abandonment of the nomadic life, the caravans that Lutbak refers to still exist. Lake Asal is the lowest point on the African continent and the third lowest in the world. It is located 153 meters below the sea, whose proximity is evident from any one of the volcanoes that surround it. In fact, at some point in time, it was connected to this sea, and some believe that it still is through underground channels. The high level of evaporation, 330 grams per liter, causes the water to be saturated with salt and broad expanses of terrain to be fabulous salt mines, which the nomads have used to trade with since time immemorial. I agree that things are not going well, that the economy is slow, but I would not stop coming to the beach even if my day job allowed me to. I like to wait and not know what will happen, if Ibrahim will come tonight or if he won't. I have always lived on the sea, and this is the only way that I know how to feel good. For me, my job is what I do during the day. This is something that keeps me alive. Amin was born in the city of Djibouti, and his daily job consists of taking the chat to Tajura every day when it comes in from Ethiopia by plane. Chat is a stimulant, a plant that gives energy and improves the memory. On a daily basis, Djibouti imports eight tons of this drug, which is produced in the mountains near the city of Harar. The higher quality plants travel by air. The rest travel by train or in all-terrain vehicles. Chat loses its properties on the third day after being cut, which is why each phase must be carried out as fast as possible until it is finally consumed. In the city, as well as at sea, the intermediaries like Amin compete to be the first ones to offer the product.
The consumption of chat in Djibouti is generalized. Sex, age, and social class make no distinction. Geography doesn't either. It's consumed in the cities and in the nomadic camps, in the labor camps, and at the fishing ports. The Gulf of Dajura is a big geographic obstacle for the transportation of the chat plant. The fastest way for chat to reach the extreme opposite end of the Gulf is in a speedboat. This belly of the sea between the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden has always been a favored setting for the legal and illegal traffic of all kinds of merchandise. The sale of chat is legal, but before, the sale of arms, slaves and ivory was legal as well. When they were prohibited, traffic did not stop. It only continued through smuggling, provoking an increase in price. Something like this also happened with Chad in 1977, when the president of the country made it illegal. He wanted to prevent the disastrous consequences that the consumption of this drug had on day-to-day -day work. Considering its prohibition, consumption did not decrease, but rather mafias emerged and the prices rose. A popular uprising, the only one during more than 20 years of independence, led the government to overturn the law and legalize the consumption of Chad once again. During the day and at night, the Gulf of Dajura is an idyllic scene for the constant coming and going of smuggling vessels. Tajura, a coastal town, is where Amin takes his load of chat every day. It's one of the oldest towns on the east coast of Africa. Its trading history dates back, according to the Arabic texts, to the 12th century. In its day, it was the origin of numerous caravans headed for Abyssinia. During the long year that Kimbo had to wait before being able to leave with the caravan towards Ethiopia, he lived in Tajura. He wanted to sell weapons to Menelik II, one of the Ethiopian kings disputing the territory. He left Obok, reached his destination, and once there, Menelik deceived him and confiscated his weapons. The ships arrived at Tajura from India or China and unloaded exotic merchandise in exchange for slaves or ostrich feathers. It was a starting point and ending point for a trade that grew while inspired by legendary heroes like Simbad the Sailor or authentic adventurers like Henri de Montfried or Arthur Rimbaud. Even today, the final destination of the salt caravans is the town of Tajura. Do you remember Prohibition? That was when I began to sell chat. Those were the days. I would arrive secretly, 
crossing the border by land. Even the dry plants went for twice as much as today. <laughs> Starting at one in the afternoon, the country is paralyzed and everyone spends his or her time chewing chat. Chat is a social stimulant that is taken with the family, at celebrations or at religious gatherings. Its effects are very similar to those of an amphetamine, but conveniently blended with the necessary doses of mysticism, it produces surprising states of collective ecstasy. Chat is a religion of its own. I don't believe it. I am not like you guys, the fishermen who see devils and goblins everywhere. I have passed by there hundreds of times and I have never seen anything. But there must be something, since so many boats have disappeared there. Why there and nowhere else? Those beasts are there. They must be really deep and only come out when the sun sets. I've heard hundreds of stories and you can tell that they are true. If not, how do you explain the water heating up all of a sudden and it turning red? And the strange whirlpools that form? And how the island disappears? The place that Hassan is referring to is known as Gubet al-Karab, or the Devil's Gulf. The Bay of Gubet lives trapped in the center of a myth, a myth that creates a land of taboos for most of the local fishermen. The legend says that here, there was a great mountain crowned by fire that was swallowed by the sea towards the catacombs of the earth. On a regular basis, the demons of the underworld used this gate to hell in order to come and go from the human world. There is some truth in all of this. Right here, in the corner of the Horn of Africa, one of the most important geological collisions on the Earth takes place. The Earth's surface is formed by six tectonic plates. Djibouti is located at the meeting point of three of them. This corner between Gubet and Lake Asal is the hottest point of this monumental collision of subterranean layers. The geological interest of this region reaches far back in time. The first time that Tilar de Chardin passed through here in 1939, he said that this region belonged to a continental drift area and that the theory of the separation of the continents could be demonstrated here. In Gubet, the rift began, which would later form the Ethiopian lakes, Lake Victoria, and the Ngorongoro crater.
This fault arose over one million years ago, but its last eruption dates back to 1978. The big crack continues to open in a process whose consequence, in several million years, will be the disappearance of Djibouti under an ocean that will join the Mediterranean. This activity releases energy and creates volcanic crises that provoke the regular appearance of red patches throughout Goubet. People interpret these facts as being somewhat unusual and believe the events to be diabolic phenomena, just like this place, known as Devil's Island. Well, it is simply that these islands emerged after underwater volcanic eruptions, like those that we have talked about. All these things brought about the idea that the devil appeared in these places. But if not, just think of Samala. Does she or doesn't she have magical powers? Wherever she goes, she's always fishing. The schools of fish seem to follow her. Even I have found myself following her in order to catch something. Among the numerous living legends that travel around the Gulf of Dajura, one of the most surprising ones turns Samala into a kind of goddess of the waters. She is the only female fisherman on the Gulf, and according to popular belief, she has magical powers that allow her to know where the best schools of fish are to be found. This is not true. I fish like everyone else. There are days when I don't catch anything, and there are other days when I make up for it by catching a lot, just like everyone else. No more and no less. The truth of the matter is that this is a job for men, and they don't like to see me fishing, which is why they say that I have magical powers, like an excuse to treat me in a different way. Samala's father, who is from Sudan, helps her. He was born in the capital and for many years belonged to the Sufi Brotherhood of Khartoum. The Sufis represent the most mystical side of Islam. Through the study of breathing, dance, and the knowledge of secret magical formulas, the Sufis reach ecstasy and hope to come in contact with God. Maybe it's not Samala, but her father who attracts the fish. Hassan is one of the many fishermen who work the Gulf of Tajura. His family has also been dedicated to fishing, especially shellfish, for so many generations that he cannot remember. His father and grandfather were pearl hunters. For centuries, the pearls of the Red Sea and the nearby coast of Djibouti were very highly valued in the Orient. Hundreds of families lived exclusively from this kind of fishing, and they sold the pearls to the intermediaries who arrived on the ships coming from Japan and India.
A few years ago, the government granted a monopoly for the cultivation of pearls to a French company, and the fishermen were forced to be retrained. Many stopped fishing and moved to the city. Others, like Hassan, started to catch lobsters, which they sell to the hotel complexes on the breathtaking beaches of Djibouti. Hassan usually fishes near Muncha, one of the islands most frequented by international tourists. Before, these islands were a refuge for pirates and smugglers. Today, they are natural reserves whose mangroves and coral are preserved like the booty from a treasure island. I don't really enjoy this. I do it for the money. I left the desert in order to be able to pay for my children's education. And if Ibrahim stops coming, I think I will go back to tending animals and to selling salt. Ludbak spent many years dedicated to the ancestral trading of salt. He was the first member of his family, after many generations, to leave the desert and migrate to the city. But the activity has not stopped, although it is subsiding due to the modern ways of production that make it difficult to commercialize a product that takes weeks from the time it is collected to the time it can be consumed. Fortunately, the salt from Lake Asal is a refined salt that can be used without any special kind of production process. The Afars consume the salt themselves, and even today they sell it in the coastal towns and in the inland mountains of Ethiopia. The times when salt was used as money, with a value similar to that of gold or silver, are gone, however. Yet salt still lets several dozen families earn a living from the last breath of a world that is vanishing inevitably. The salt, as they have traded it traditionally, does not have a place on the market. The salt marsh of Lake Asal is already being exploited in a semi-industrial manner by companies that extract the salt with specialized machinery and transport it in big trucks. The project of extracting the salt from the lake in an industrial way comes from ancient times. The poet Rimbaud, in his lesser lyrical phase, talked about taking salt from Goubet 
and building a train that would connect the lake and the sea. Since colonial times, different concessions opened the door to large-scale exploitation, but the inaccessibility and the extreme climatic conditions made these exploitations fail. According to modern statistics, this is the hottest point on the Earth's crust. Until recently, only the Afars, who have been deceiving death for hundreds of years in this antechamber to hell, have been able to survive and maintain the salt trade thanks to sustained exploitation. The arrival of the big machines and trucks threatens to ruin them once and for all. The Afars, according to their own legends, are direct descendants of the biblical Noah. Of the 500,000 inhabitants of Djibouti, 60,000 are nomads divided into two major tribes, the Isas of the south and the Afars of the north. Their relationship has not always been exactly friendly. Competition for water and pastures has provoked many confrontations. Just in case, the nomads rarely remove their cartridge belts and they often carry firearms with them as well. The times have changed and the wars have ended, but it is still difficult to witness marriages between the two tribes. Even in the city, they live in separate neighborhoods. The nomadic life is ending. In a few years, these men and women will have settled down forever. They will head for the city or establish stable camps where survival will be even more difficult than it is today. Ludbak was the first member of his family, but just one of the thousands of Isas and Afars who have abandoned their traditional lifestyle to try to find a better life. They seldom find it, but they have no other alternative. The only thing left for them is devastation and death. Ludbak was able to prosper in his escape to the city. This is not an exception. Many people prosper. But those who fail share the same look in their eyes. The sensation of rootlessness. The complex of having lost their place in the world. Ludbak, Amin, and Hassan are waiting for Ibrahim. They do this once a week when the special loads come in. Aside from their regular jobs, the four of them are smugglers in Djibouti. Ibrahim brings gasoline, which costs twice as much in Djibouti, in exchange for alcohol and American tobacco. The prohibition of alcohol in Yemen has created a black market whose profits are quite substantial. The boxes of vodka, gin, and especially whiskey can triple their value on the other side of the coast. And if their final destination is Saudi Arabia, the price increases fivefold. 
Most of the high-quality whiskey is usually consumed by the big sheiks of that country. Ibrahim's daily job is shark fishing. He doesn't earn as much as he does smuggling, but it's a more secure job. The waters of the Gulf are rich and abundant in species like sharks, whose value on the market is high if sold by parts. Shark fishing is usually carried out in the areas surrounding the Island of the Seven Brothers, one of the most breathtaking places on the coast of Djibouti. Its name comes from another legend, to which the local fishermen attribute the presence of everything that is important to them. According to this legend, seven terrible outlaws spent years attacking ships and entire towns along the long coast of Yemen. Those pirates were brothers, and they never left a town without raping all the women or stripping the estates clean. None of the sultans who governed this territory were able to capture those evasive men. They moved around in small ships, attacking and disappearing like authentic attack squads. Only the force of nature was able to stop them. One night, while they were sailing along the coast, a terrible storm took them by surprise. The avenging force of the wind converted the seven brothers into seven small islands. Aside from its apparent beauty, it's one of the most violent areas of the Gulf, with strong winds and regular storms. The seven brothers were condemned to being struck by the waves of the sea forever. These are good waters for shark fishing, however. It's not an easy form of fishing. It requires patience and strength to hoist the sharks to the surface.
Almost every part of the shark is taken advantage of. The tastiest meat comes from the young sharks. The skin is used for sandpaper, and the teeth, if they're big, are sold to tourists. But without a doubt, the part that yields the most profit is the fin. The fin is saved and later sold to oriental traders who pay a fortune for it. I make my trips to Yemen at night. I follow the route parallel to the coast through Ras Bir and the island of Perim. I know this area well. It is also where I fish. Although what we do is illegal, no one gives us too much trouble because it is of interest to everyone that these things travel back and forth. Drinking alcohol is prohibited over there, but a lot of people drink while only a very few can afford to pay for it. The ones who prohibit drinking are the ones who benefit the most from smuggling. There is a lot of merchandise that is smuggled to and from the Red Sea. Ibrahim and his companions carry out jobs of very small magnitude and smuggle products of little interest. There are hundreds of fishermen and modest sea workers who earn extra income by smuggling. But this narrow crossing is also a stage for the large-scale trafficking of arms and drugs. The United Nations spends $100 million a year trying to fight it, with hardly any results to show for it. Another of the new products being smuggled by traffickers are animals in danger of extinction. And once again, one of the major distribution centers is Djibouti. The main point of this problem is not compensating the traffickers when we stop them. The most important thing is to stop them and send them back to their country without any money, which is going to discourage them from smuggling again. These baby cheetahs were seized with the help of the Djibouti police. For several years now, there has been real progress in this field. These animals were seized by the police, and it is always done in the same way. The intermediary shows a Polaroid photograph of the animal, which usually is being held in the poorer neighborhoods of the city. The intermediary tries to show his interest in buying it, and at that moment, the trafficker is discovered and arrested by the police. These animals originally come from the interior lands of Africa and end up at the mansions of rich Arab or Western businessmen. Dubai and the United Arab Emirates are the following stops once they leave Djibouti. Dubai is the crux of the problem because many buyers from the Arab world go there. Just a short time ago, they even proposed selling us a snow panther from the Himalayas. But what do they do with the animals? This is where there's a real problem. The government wants the animals to stay here. But if they stay, you have to give them a chance to survive. And there are not many solutions. 
A reproduction center for animals in danger of extinction could be built. At present, though, nothing like this exists. Since they came into existence, the port and city of Djibouti have always been a key point for maritime trade, whether legal or illegal, between the Mediterranean and the Orient. Most of the merchandise that enters the port of Djibouti does so legally. From there, the job of the intermediary begins, as he distributes each product in the right direction. Alcohol goes to the north. Cheap Chinese clothes head for Ethiopia and the interior of the continent. Perfumes and other luxury products are reserved for the wealthy classes of Eastern Africa. The city of Djibouti has grown around this coming and going of merchandise. But this is nothing new. It's always been this way. Due to its strategic location, Djibouti has always been a land favorable to easy profits, a kind of magnet for the exotic and prohibited merchandise of each time period. A perfect land for adventure that attracted men like Henri de Manfred, one of the biggest names in travel literature. His father was a very good friend of the painter Paul Gauguin, and this friendship opened his eyes to other worlds. In 1911, he left his wife and children and boarded a ship for Djibouti to begin a long life of adventures in Ethiopia and on the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean. He was a coffee, arms, and pearl dealer, a convert to Islam, a smoker of opium, and the author of more than 70 travel adventure books. He followed in the footsteps of Rimbaud, of Burton, and of many others who abandoned their comfortable lives in the pursuit of the perverse dream of prospering in faraway lands. Heroes in flesh and blood, or in legends like El Corto Maltes, the character of Hugo Pratt, who also lived in these latitudes. go by, and so do the centuries, but Djibouti continues to be what it has always been, a land favorable to adventure.